Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today and welcome to the Conflict and Crime session. Without any further ado, please welcome our chair, Mr. Nishit Prakash, to open this session. Mr. Prakash, the screen is yours. Thank you so much. Um, we have our first speaker, Ernesto, who is going to uh, present uh, his paper. So um, all yours, Ernesto, you have roughly 12 minutes. And we have three minutes for question and answer. And all the attendees, please feel free to ask questions in the chat box. Thank you. Very good. Can you uh, see my full screen? Thank yes. you very much, uh, Nishit. This is a joint work with uh, Rafael Vitella and Sebastian Galliani. Our paper is on persuasive propaganda during the 2015 Argentine presidential uh, ballotage. Um, an important question in politics regards the ability of incumbent governments to affect voter preferences through several ways, but for example, through state sponsors, sponsor propaganda. In advanced democracies, political campaigns are constrained by norms, by norms and institutions that uh, protect the, the, I mean, the equity of the electoral uh, process. Uh, one important institution is, of course, the free press, which uh, ensures that um, through competition, people who do not want to consume some political advertisement can avoid it. Uh, in developing countries, however, these constraints are often weaker and uh, state-sponsored propaganda is uh, uh, more frequent. But at the same time, because of that, it is possible to speculate that as people are more aware of the possibility of media bias, they may be more likely to discount its influence on the, on the abuse. Uh, in this paper, we exploit um, experimental data uh, to study a state-sponsored propaganda campa campaign against the opposition candidate during the, the 2015 Argentine presidential election. Uh, in particular, uh, in, a, in a country where soccer, we call it football, uh, is uh, extremely popular, uh, the government used the state monopoly of the TV broadcasting of soccer matches to send uh, messages, political messages to a captive audience attacking the opposition candidate. This was made through political ads that were aired regularly during soccer transmission, both at uh, half time during the, with the, together with the highlights and the, and the goals from the first half and also throughout the, uh, the games. Um, as I mentioned, this was, I mean, this was evident for viewers, uh, but uh, few viewers had to cope with it uh, in order to be able to watch uh, soccer games. Um, so we exploit two features. One is uh, the likely awareness of potential bias, bias by uh, citizens, by consumers, together with uh, difficulty in avoiding these messages if you want to see, uh, if you want to watch a, a soccer game. Uh, I'm, of course, going to skip the, I mean, the references to the literature. We have a very, a very uh, short time. Uh, our setting uh, are the 2015 presidential election. There was a, a first round where the incumbent candidate defeated the opposition candidate, but because the votes were not enough, uh, a ballotage was uh, called. And right at the beginning, because of most of the voters of the other uh, candidates leaning toward the opposition candidate, Macri, uh, he seemed to be well ahead in the polls. Um, during that interim period, a campaign was launched uh, by the, by the uh, incumbent government accusing Macri of resemblance with the bloody military dictatorship that uh, took uh, uh, government in the country from 1976 to 83 and of being in favor of uh, reducing wages. 
And this campaign was launched uh, during, uh, I mean, uh, at halftime of uh, a very important soccer game where the most uh, popular team, uh, Boca Juniors, was about to win the, the, the championship. And then it was reproduced in several uh, other uh, shows and media. And the, I mean, the campaign continued uh, till basically till the time of the of the ballotage. And this use of soccer games for sending political messages was a way to uh, to get uh, to a very considerable considerable audience, given the size of the of the uh, TV audience and the size of the uh, citizen uh, electorate. Um, basically, all the publicity in this TV show, Football Para Todos, which was broadcasting uh, soccer for free, was uh, state uh, sponsors. When the campaign started, the Macri electoral team, uh, basically, I mean, they thought that there was little they could do. Uh, they had a, one reaction, which was a continue where they are positive exposure of their uh, um, future policies. There was uh, also an ad addressing the accusations by this uh, campaign. And there was also some counter attack accusing the uh, uh, government candidate of having uh, um, supported neoliberal policies in, in the past. Uh, so basically, we explored uh, an RCT, a randomized control trial performed by a consulting firm. Um, in this uh, randomized control trial, which was run on uh, an online panel of uh, individuals, which are somewhat a little bit richer than the Argentine average uh, population, um, what this RCT did was to uh, expose one third of the randomly, one third of the participants to a placebo, one third of the participants to this uh, propaganda uh, advertisement. And then the other third was divided in three and they were exposed to the propaganda advertisement and also to three antidotes. The positive reply by Macri, the defensive reply by Macri and this uh, a counter attack. Um, so we have a sample of uh, uh, 1,200 participants. There is an issue of uh, a mild issue of attrition during the experiment that we address in the paper. If I have time, I'm, I, I'm going to explain. There were some introductory uh, questions. And then after these videos were shown, uh, participants were asked uh, their intention to vote in the future ballotage round. They were also asked after the videos what they had voted um, in the first round. But in order not to prime them, uh, this was asked after the, the videos. What was not asked was whether they had already seen or not this uh, political advertisement by the, by the government. Uh, so, because an RCT, the, um, the econometrics are, are very simple. Uh, the dependent variable is the intention to vote in the ballotage against this uh, treatment, the propaganda or the antidotes, and a bunch of uh, uh, controls. Um, the, ex the randomization was successful. Uh, so, we, when we look at observable pre-treatment characteristics in the original sample and also in the sample uh, without the, this, uh, there were 70, 69 treaters. Um, uh, basically the, the, the pre-treatment characteristics are similar across the groups. Um, so finally, I mean, not finally, going to the results, uh, we, found that the political campaign is quite successful. There is a reduction of 6.5 percentage points, percentage points in the intention to vote for Macri. Uh, there is an increase of, and this goes 
4.5 go to people uh, getting undecided and two points go to uh, people uh, that now they, they say they are going to go vote for the incumbent uh, candidate uh, Scioli. The antidotes, in the same way that the leaders... Uh, yes. Uh, have a minute. Yeah. How many minutes? Uh, one minute to uh, wrap up. One minute. Good. Um, the antidotes uh, didn't didn't work, and this was anticipated by the the managers of the of the Macri campaign. And importantly, basically, all the effect comes from women. No, there is no effect from from men, and we can speculate that this could be either because they were not exposed to this video before because uh, men watch more soccer than women in Argentina, or that women, like some literature shows, are more sensitive to the social consequence of economic adjustments. And the results are robust to caring about this issue of um, attrition, and also to control for vote in the first round, and all these uh, new votes, I mean, all, mainly the action is coming from women and from uh, the people who vote other candidates in the, uh, in the, in the first round. Uh, so these are basically my, uh, our, uh, our results uh, about the effectiveness of this propaganda campaign. Finally, Macri won the election, but, but it, for a very, very uh, small uh, margin. Thank you very much, uh, Nishit. Thank you so much, Ernesto. Uh, we don't have any questions in the chat box. Uh, I will encourage the attendees to please uh, ask questions in the chat box. And I mean, you can continue to do that because Ernesto can answer the question while other presenters are still presenting. So uh, we'll move to our next uh, paper. Uh, and Camilo, I, you, you're next. So. There is a question by, by Sofia about women being influenced by their spouses. Unfortunately, we, we cannot measure that, uh, that uh, externality because uh, people participate in this uh, uh, experiment by, by themselves. Uh, so we, we do not have data about, uh, uh, about uh, couples. But it is, I mean, it's a good question. I mean, the, we leave the, the gender issue uh, there is, uh, I mean, a significant discussion in the paper about the, the gender issue uh, as uh, something which basically requires further research. Thank you, uh, Camilo. Uh... Thank you, Ernesto, for that presentation. Hello to everyone. My name is Camilo Gomez. I'm from Universidad Nacional de Colombia. Today I'm presenting you a joint work with Francesco Oliacino and Gianluca Grimalda. The title of the work is Crime-Related Exposure to Violence and Social Preferences, Experimental Evidence from Bogota. Uh, Francesco is also in the session, so if you have any questions, you can ask uh, him um, through the chat, okay? So let's begin. Uh, the exposure to violence is an important feature of human society and particularly is important in the Latin American context. In the literature, there has been a widespread interest in studying the behavioral consequences of exposure to violence, where there is this stylized fact that um, exposure to a conflict-related uh, violence can foster prosocial behavior with a potential in-group bias. And this result is supported by this important uh, work by Bauer and co-authors where they did uh, a meta-analysis and found robust evidence of this positive relationship. In the literature, there are also some theoretical mechanisms or channels that could explain this positive relationship between, between uh, these variables, but these uh, mechanisms are based on a conflict-related uh, violence. So the question here is, if is if we can extend these uh, results when we move to a crime-related exposure to violence context for two main reasons. The first one is that 
uh, from an empirical point of view, there is not a large evidence and is not conclusive about the direction of this effect. And from a theoretical point of view, when we are in a crime related context, the group dimension is not there because consider that the victimization in a conflict related is mostly individualized. So the research question that we have in this paper is first, if there is a, a, an effect of the exposure to violence uh, in a crime related context on prosocial behavior, we also want to know if there is an in-group bias in this behavior. And then we want to explore some causal mechanisms um, behind this positive, uh, behind this relationship. So let's move on to the methodology. All of you know that exposure to violence uh, is not a random issue. However, in the literature, uh, you can find a variety uh, of techniques and methods to identify the causal impact of exposure to violence. And in this paper, we use a method that uh, is to manipulate a recall of a violence experience. This method is interesting because we cannot directly manipulate the exposure to violence, but we can manipulate a recall of a violence experience. And doing this, we can induce people or participants in a state of mind that is very similar to that state of mind that, that they feel when, when they were exposed to violence. So in this paper, we run two main experiments where we manipulate um, two different versions of violence recall. The first version is, is a direct question where we ask participants to uh, recall a violence experience. And the other one is uh, to induce a negative endowment shock uh, because we think that uh, this negative endowment shock could help people to recall violence because exposure to violence is also related with, economic, uh, with an economic loss. So then we also collect uh, some measures uh, of self-reported exposure to violence. And we know that these self-reported measure have some uh, uh, endogenous issues because it's not random, but since the level of exposure to violence in our sample was relatively high, we use an intensive margin analysis to reduce these endogenous issues. So our main strategy, uh, identification strategy here is to uh, estimate a difference in difference model when, where we interact this exogenous manipulation of the violence recall with these uh, in, in margins of exposure to violence in a high group and a low group of, ex, uh, of level of expose, exposure to violence. Then um, to identify if there is an in-group bias, we use a variation of a falcon sender design. Um, and finally, we collected some uh, variables uh, and measures to, to assess the suggested mechanisms by the literature about the relationship between exposure to violence and prosocial behavior. And we conduct an additional experiment to test a more generalized explanation behind this relationship. So I'm going to show you the overview of this experiment because maybe I don't have enough time to talk about all, but in the first two experiments, <clears throat> We manipulate the, uh, the recall of a violence experience. We also collected um, a measure of exposure to violence and we identified if there is a, an effect of the exposure to violence. For the first experiment, we have a, a trust game plus a dictator game. For the second experiment, we have a prisoner's dilemma game plus a dictator game. And the main results are uh, first that we found a positive effect of exposure to violence on, on prosocial measures. And we also found that there is an ingrid bias at district level in trust, but not in cooperation uh, in the prisoner's dilemma game. And we didn't find differences by the level of exposure to violence. Then we explored the theoretical channel behind this positive relationship. So first we look at the causal mechanisms proposed by the literature and we didn't find any robust evidence to, to support any of these mechanisms. And finally, I, 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 I think I'm not, I'm not going to have enough time to explain the third experiment, but we tested a more generalized explanation uh, where we look at the uh, negative emotion channel and a cognitive load channel to, to test if the effect of the positive uh, effect of exposure to violence could be driven uh, by these two uh, causal mechanisms. 
Again, the result in this last experiment is that um, the results are not conclusive. The evidence is not conclusive. So uh, the first two experiments were uh, artifactal field experiments were run in Bogota, Colombia. Colombia is in the north of South America. And in the first experiment, we have participants from different districts of Bogota. We have a total sample of 281 participants and the stage game was a, trust, a standard trust game where the sender and the receiver uh, had an initial endowment of, of two tokens. And the sender were asked uh, district contingent decisions as Falcon Sender did in order to know if there is an ingrid bias. Uh, we also collected two trustworthiness decisions by um, a strategy method, and we had a role switching in this game. At the end of the experiment, through a post-experimental uh, questionnaire, we collect the self-reported measure of exposure to, uh, to violence through a validated uh, battery of questions. Finally, we have a two-by-two two between subject design, where on the one hand, we have one treatment that was the violence recall, where we ask participants to recall the, uh, a violence experience. Of course, we also have the placebo or the neutral recall to compare this treatment. And we also have a third party punishment condition in the trust game as the second uh, treatment in this design. Then the second experiment, again, we have 223 participants uh, from different districts of Bogota. But here the stage game was a prisoner's dilemma game, but with a loss framing. This means that participants or players receive uh, 20 tokens as initial endowment and they had to interact uh, and they had to decide how much they wanted to lose in this game in the interaction with the other in the other with the other player um, again after uh, the decisions were contingent to the districts and uh, at the end we collect the measure the self reported measure of exposure to violence the design was again a between a two by two between subject uh, design where we replicate uh, on the one hand the same uh, violence recall through a direct question as in experiment one. But here we manipulate a, a negative well shock in the initial endowment of participants. This was a reduction of the 50% of the initial endowment before the participants uh, uh, played the, the prisoner's dilemma game. So now I want to show you the main result of this paper. Um, here you can see, uh, the, remember that we estimated a difference in difference model. So here we are reporting the, the coefficients for these estimations for the experiment one, the first one and the other three for the experiment two. In the experiment one on, in, on the first y axis, you can uh, see the prosocial outcome. This was a C-score variable standardized where we collect all the uh, trust, trustworthiness and altruism decision from experiment one. And on the second y-axis, you can see the, uh, the probability of cooperation in the prisoner's dilemma game. As you can see, it is a positive, uh, there is a positive. Okay. Milo, you have five minutes. Okay, thank you. So um, here you can see uh, that, that there is a positive and significant effect of the exposure, of, of the exposure to violence on on prosocial uh, on on prosocial outcome and prisoners and the probability of cooperation, except in the last uh, in the last uh, coefficient where the effect is positive but is not significant. So we found that the first result is that we found uh, that exposure to violence in a criminal related context uh, increases different measures of prosocial behavior. The second main result is that when we look at the in-group bias at district level, we found that in the trust game, participants sent on average 20% um, more tokens to a member of the same group, uh, of the same district with respect to other districts. But when we move to the uh, prisoner's dilemma game, the cooperation is not different between the in-group and the out-group. The second result here is that when we interact this in-group bias by the level of exposure to violence, we didn't find differential effects um, in, the, in the result. So remember that the third um, question was to identify uh, the, the causal mechanism behind this positive relationship. 
So we uh, look at the possible, the, the theoretical mechanism proposed by the literature that remember is more a conflict related violence, not a, a criminal related violence. Uh, the first mechanism is a neoclassical economic explanation through changes on belief where uh, being prosocial is the optimal choice. The second is an evolutionary explanation where uh, through changes of parochial social norms. And the last, the last one is a psychological theory where uh, the post-shock growth increases the, the, the prosocial behavior after exposure to violence. So here, I don't have enough time to explain all the variables, but we have a particular, uh, we have for each of these mechanisms, uh, an outcome variable, and we estimate the same difference and difference model to know, to, to look at if there is a, a, a mechanism that could explain the effect. This is the result. The, the, the main result is that there is not. We only have evidence for one of the beliefs, but as you can see, there, this result is not, uh, robust, uh, neither for the experiment one uh, nor the experiment two. So uh, to finish, we look for, based on the re these results, we look for a generalized explanation that could work uh, in both contexts, in a conflict related and in a criminal related violence. So we know that exposure to violence uh, induces a strong negative emotion and a cognitive load, according to a work of, by Francesco Olesino and, and co-authors. And we also know, uh, according to some neuroeconomics of emotions theory by the Clerc and Bon and, and social heuristic hypothesis by Rand, that negative emotions and cognitive load may induce prosocial behavior. So we wanted to uh, explore these two uh, possible causal channels, uh, the negative emotion and the cognitive load, uh, as a possible mechanism behind the effect of the positive, uh, of more prosocial behavior. So we conduct a, an extra experiment. We uh, run uh, a trust might, game. Uh, Camilo, you might want to uh, wrap up uh, if people have questions. Like, so. Okay, I'm going to, to close here. So the, the result is that we didn't find evidence to support these um, two causal uh, channels. And the, the concluding remarks are, are that first, we found a, a positive um, evidence in that exposure to violence in a crime-related context can increase a uh, prosocial uh, behavior with an in-group bias, but without differences by the level of exposure to violence in trust, but not in cooperation. And finally, we didn't uh, find a uh, robust evidence for neither of the causal mechanism proposed by the literature nor for the generalized explanation proposed by, by, by us. So thank you. And okay, let's go with, with the equation. Thank you, Camilo. Uh, we, we have like a minute for a question. So maybe, you know, one question. Any questions or? I think Francesco answered all the questions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, to all attendees, please do take advantage and uh, ask questions. Uh, so I'm going to go next and. Okay. Screen mode. Oops. Share. So uh, is it uh, visible in full screen? Yes. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> I'm going to present this paper about uh, women police stations in India. It's a uh, joint with uh, Sophia Amaral and Sonia Balotra. And uh, Sophia is in the panelists, so she'll be taking questions. If, uh, so given in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, quickly do the motivation tell you a bit about the data we use and of course the identification and just like you know uh, two three main results so uh, <clears throat> gender based violence it's a, it's it's a pretty global problem rather than just about india and what's so unique about or maybe what's so challenging about this problem is it cuts across boundaries of race religion uh, culture age gender wealth it's very pervasive. It's like, you know, one out of three women experience some form of gender-based violence. 
uh, with implications at both micro and macro levels. So if you look at more as a, you know, in terms of lost productivity, the cost of GBV ranges from one to three or 4%. Uh, and then it has kind of like, you know, wide implication in terms of physical, mental well-being. And now there are new papers which are talking about how it affects uh, output, like, you know, economic output, growth, mobility, uh, education, and uh, more in terms of like, you know, uh, social and health services. Uh, uh, and some of the papers are from developing countries and the two, uh, like oh, shit. is your screen moving? Are you still in the cover page or is it, have you moved slide? No, I'm in the, I'm in the motivation page. Uh, we Are cannot you? see, we cannot, see, your, your screen is frozen. Yeah, uh, now, now it's coming. Now it yeah. finds. Well, now Maybe it's just gone. don't turn it into full, just don't turn it into full screen. Just leave it as, just leave it like this. Yeah. Okay. This is visible to everyone? Yeah. Glad you pointed out. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> so some of these papers are from uh, India and some from the US. Uh, it's one of the top priorities uh, of the, uh, you know, uh, of the agenda in the sustainable development goals. It's really complex and it's really hard, like something that, you know, uh, me and Sophia and uh, Girija and uh, a couple of other co-authors, we have been broadly working on this topic for quite some time and uh, what we realize that it's a very complex problem and uh, to solve some of these or even to attempt to solve these problems requires uh, borrowing insights from various disciplines and, and, and not just econ. So what I'm going to talk about today is we are, I'm going to present you evidence of uh, the impact of women police stations uh, that was uh, uh, launched in India and how it impacted uh, kind of reporting of crime, uh, women's uh, proactive behavior towards gender-based violence, some measures of crime deterrence and women labor supply. And uh, some, uh, just to kind of give you a background about women police station, they are, uh, they typically deal only with violence against women. And they're supposed to, uh, in, in theory, use uh, uh, only female police officers, although there's always a lag because whenever the state kind of launches uh, such women police stations, they have limited number of women officers and slowly kind of catches up. This is nothing, this is not unique to India. It has been kind of used in other countries. Uh, and however, uh, <clears throat> we know, uh, I guess the evidence, uh, whether such policies across the world and how effective they are, we know uh, we have limited evidence. So what do we find? We find that uh, the women police station kind of intervention in India led to a 29% increase in reporting of rate of total violence against women. And it's mainly being driven by kind of uh, uh, female kidnappings. Uh, and we actually find a significant uh, uh, impact on uh, female employment after the opening of women police station. That's roughly like 6.5%. Uh, and to give you a background, like just like uh, about India, it was first opened in Kerala in 1973. Then it was like, you know, kind of launched in a big way in Tamil Nadu. It's one of the southern state. Uh, what they do is they typically have female uh, 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 officers. The chief of the police station is a female. They are supposed to handle only crimes against women. Uh, they have, I mean, the officers are of the same quality, so it's not as if like those are employed uh, in the women police station are of any inferior quality. Uh, and there has been a kind of like a very steady growth of women police stations over time. And there is a sharp trajectory since 2009. Uh, so I'm going to skip this. We use like lots of data sets in this paper. So I think that's like uh, something uh, <clears throat> that uh, I have enjoyed and like, you know, both uh, me, Sophia and Sonia, like, you know, putting together so many sources all, uh, to answer these questions. But the primary source is one of the uh, Government of India report, which is called, the. Uh, it's about police organization. It provides the location of women police station across India and the date of rollout. And then we use kind of other sources to kind of uh, uh, complete this list. Uh, then, uh, then the crime data comes from, uh, which has been